cough on you guys. He said he knew you guys. Yep. You know the district superintendent? Okay. And uh, the regent? Mm -hmm. I'm regent Dawson, and I'm Rick Nolson, the Commissioner of Education. Uh, we have another district superintendent. You can sit back there. You can join. Okay. Two more. Uh, it looks like there's. Oh, yes, two more. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> okay, we're going to begin then. Uh, I'm Rick Mills, and uh, this is, I think, our 18th uh, day-long regional visit. Uh, the regents and I have been visiting schools and communities all around the state. Uh, we have been looking at the uh, rising uh, uh, performance, as uh, can be seen by any citizen in school report card. And uh, quite frankly, we just wanted to see the, the people behind the numbers. Uh, all of these visits uh, begin with uh, visits to schools. And then we uh, talk to the uh, <clears throat> community through, uh, through the media. We uh, have a uh, series of meetings in the afternoon, as we will this afternoon, with uh, uh, the school leaders, the superintendents, and boards, and principals, and others. Uh, and then later tonight, we'll uh, talk with the community. Uh, I'll have with me some of uh, the school leaders that I've met in the schools. Uh, this is um, part of the state where performance is already very high. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to announce the uh, most recent uh, elementary grade uh, results in, uh, uh, in English. I uh, can't get into that today, so I'm uh, looking at uh, the results uh, from students uh, last year uh, when they started when I started the year, seniors um, who um, uh, were in the cohort that began the ninth grade in 1996 have already uh, been very, very successful. 95% of them here in the North Country have uh, already met the English standard. And they've done it the hard way by passing the English Regents exam. So um, this is a uh, part of the state where people uh, expect high performance and they get it. Um, one of the schools that we visited this morning uh, in uh, Ticonderoga that was, a, I think, a, a good example of uh, what you see. Uh, I was drawn to that school because they had uh, very high performance in mathematics in the eighth grade. The new eighth grade exam last year was quite challenging for everyone. But it didn't seem to be very challenging for Ticonderoga. I wanted to know why. Uh, I uh, dug deeply into the curriculum and teaching practices, not only in the eighth grade, because this is really not about what happens in the eighth grade, but what happens in all the grades leading up to that. So we, we, we watched a very skilled uh, seventh grade teacher and an equally skilled eighth grade teacher, and we saw a very uh, rigorous curriculum we presented to all children, and uh, strong, strong teaching practices, and it was all backed up by uh, a uh, very focused uh, school principal. These are the three elements that we see everywhere we can find high performance. Strong leadership at the building level, uh, strong curriculum, and skilled uh, teaching practices that are constantly honed. So that's, that's really the, the heart of it. Uh, Mr. Dawson, do you want to add anything? Take some questions. Perhaps the most telling comment to me was the uh, seventh grade teacher who, uh, when he spoke to his students at the beginning of the year, said, well, we're going to do algebra. And there was an enthusiasm, there was enthusiasm in the, in the room uh, from the students uh, when he told them that, because they saw algebra as the opportunity to do adult level mathematics, the challenging mathematics. And uh, I've been in districts where at the seventh grade they're still doing arithmetic, and of course arithmetic in the seventh grade won't get you to passing the eighth grade standards. So uh, uh, I was just excited to see him do that, use that approach. We talk a lot about uh, test results because those are visible uh, artifacts, really, of, of success. Uh, but what's really going on is, is not about the tests. It's about uh, rigorous curriculum. It's about uh, uh, providing extra help for every child who needs it. Uh, it's about leadership. It's about uh, uh, teaching that is uh, constantly renewed. Uh, and the people I talk to are very careful about uh, people that they bring in student teachers and uh, they're very careful about uh, how they develop teaching uh, through, through the year. So, uh, why don't we just take the questions here? 
um, Commissioner, the most of the schools around here and budgets are adding staff mostly for remedial help to help students meet standards. Is that the best way to approach the problem? More teachers to help ch children who are falling behind? Well, uh, there are lots of reasons to, to add staff. I mean, across the state, a lot of people are adding staff. A lot of school districts are adding staff because of enrollment growth. Uh, That's <coughs> not the case here. In fact, not most the case of the here. Okay. Uh, it, I'm the wrong person to say uh, what, the, what the one right strategy is. Uh, there are many different things to do. Um, among the things that people can do uh, is to uh, be very, very careful about the curriculum. In one school we visited today, uh, there was a conversation going on between uh, teachers at different levels. And uh, eighth grade teachers were saying, uh, this is what I expect uh, the youngsters to know when they come into my class. That's kind of a message to the seventh grade and sixth grade. And teachers at those levels were uh, responding and saying, well, if I had that, what do I take out? And, and so there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a careful, intentional conversation about uh, what works, very, very practical conversations about what works. Uh, children make um, uh, predictable errors in a subject like mathematics. Uh, and skillful teachers study those predictable errors. They, they think hard about uh, the, the homework they're giving, the classwork, <coughs> the kinds of problems they assign, how they talk about those problems. So you, you see a tremendous amount of shifting in teaching practice, <coughs> uh, things that aren't effective being dropped, uh, <coughs> techniques that are more skilled, that are more effective being added. I was just talking with uh, people here at the OCs about uh, how superintendents are being uh, supported to think about the results because um, leadership you know, has to go right out to, uh, through the superintendent and board. Uh, there has to be a very clear message that what we want is um, children, all of them, to be better educated. And that means we have to change everything that we get what we need. We're hearing a lot of grumbling from educators that they're, being, they're now teaching to the test. I, I've been in hundreds of schools. You've been in probably close to thousands <laughs> by now. <laughs> Few hundred, <laughs> and I don't see them teaching to the test. Uh, I you smiled at that, Jim. You, you've heard that, right? I have heard that, and and I don't want to disagree with the commissioner, but to some extent, it is true. People do teach to the test, but to a great extent, that's not a problem because the test is really aligned with the the standards, or at least with the curriculum. When the curriculum is aligned with the standards, then teaching to the test is exactly what we do want them to do. Now that puts a lot of pressure on the state to develop good examinations, examinations that in fact do test the, the standards and making available, at least as a guide, a curricula that, that will get you there. And I think we've been doing that. And although I've, I've heard from some that we're teaching to the test, I've heard from an awful lot of teachers in seminars that I've had uh, that the tests are very good tests and that do in fact reach the standards and they're comfortable with that. So that's the good side of it talked about remedial work, uh, you know, the alternative to remedial work, or what I would prefer to call academic inter intervention services, is retention, keeping a child back for a whole year in a grade. I'm going to be serving on a, a study group for one of the national associations, National Association of State Boards of Education, that's looking at that question of retention, and we're finding that it's not an effective way to improve learning. Keeping a child back who's missing material early in the year, and then at the end of the year you keep them back for that same entire year over again, <coughs> doesn't make as much sense as early identification of that child's difficulties and this this focused, if you will, preparatory work or, or extra help, academic intervention to solve the really the the questions that the child's not getting that Rick was talking about that most teachers know in a given year a few t students aren't going to get anyway. So you, you, you develop a system to catch that. Mm -hmm. And that's what this academic intervention is all about. Now, if it, if it procrastinates too far, maybe that slips into a summer session. That's another kind of academic intervention service. But really, the extra time on task early in the year, early in the quarter, is, what it, is the best way to get these uh, students through the hoops so that they can still continue through the rest of the year and have a successful year. What, what I see in the standards very clear explanation of what young people should know and be able to do. And uh, in English, for example, uh, they need to understand grammar and spelling and punctuation and to be able to write with power and, and uh, 
clarity. Uh, and so what I see in classrooms that I visit is, is a great deal of writing, a great deal of discussion of writing, a great deal of reading, yeah, and then writing about what they read. Um, I don't see people uh, just drilling over uh, old test questions. Uh, that's what I meant by my answer. I, I think the instruction is, is very focused on uh, home standards. I think you all know we've also changed the style of our examinations. The new examinations are quite different. So that they, they do focus on the thinking skills. They do focus on the on the principles underlying the standards. And they're not the kind of examinations that we may have had years ago in which there's a lot of factoid kind of repetition. We're moving away from that. We recognize in an information era, people, well, you do need to have a baseline of knowledge, but people really need the skill to be able to use information. And that's been the focus of our, of our new examinations and the standards for that. Mm -hmm. well, that's where, a big change. Where does vocational training fit into the learning standards? It's uh, in mid-June um, when, when the Board of Regents reconvenes, <coughs> they will uh, again work on a uh, proposal for them on a career and technical path uh, to, this, to the Regents. To the region standards. In other words, uh, this is not intended as a vocational diploma. It's, uh, depend, it's, it's uh, intended to be a, a, an alternate path, another path uh, to exactly the same standards. Uh, within two weeks, uh, all of that will be spelled out. Will these students out. be required to, if they, if they go on this path, will they still be required to pass all five regions? Exams? Well, that's uh, we're kind of that's a great question, but it's. Uh, so two weeks premature. We're going to lay the whole thing out uh, in June. And that's going to cover the special education students. Well, it's it's uh, there. There already are. Um, uh, I understand your question correctly. Uh, students who are in special education, children with disabilities, um, already are expected to take uh, the Regents' uh, uh, exams. Uh, if they're not successful, there is a, uh, a safety net for them, uh, and they can take the Regents' competency tests. I'm talking now about students with disabilities who are going for a regular diploma as opposed to a um, to an IEP certificate, as they say. Now, students with disabilities who are in the uh, career and technical programs, um, you know, that same safety net will be in place. Uh, the whole point is to make sure that uh, everyone uh, gets the skills that they need to work for the citizens. But isn't it going to be required that the special ed students pass the regents eventually that, too? And they didn't the, have to before, right? That's the way it is now. Uh, in other words, that, that has been in practice. Uh, that, uh, two years ago, mm -hmm. like that. But they, they didn't have to get the regents to graduate, right? Well, in other words, that's strictly correct because there is this uh, safety net in place. They must attempt the regents exams. And uh, we're seeing a very dramatic change as a result of that requirement. It used to be uh, two years ago that 19 percent of the students with disabilities uh, took and passed the, uh, the English Regents exam. That's way over 35 percent. Uh, and not because you know, anything really changed except this expect expectation that they would get the opportunity. Uh, so they don't lose anything. They gain an opportunity. If, if the child is not successful uh, with the Regents exams, they take the competency test which they've taken in the past to graduate. Do you believe that because of the new standards, there will be more kids who can't, who drop out of high school or, or give up, can't make it through? The results don't show it. Uh, I'm looking at. Uh, but it just started. I'm saying in a few years. Well, if um, I mean, we could be guided by our fears, but I think it's uh, more sensible to be guided by the abundant success in this part of the state. Um, again, seniors, 95% uh, um, passed the exam. Uh, only 3% um, uh, uh, took the exam and were not successful. If you, uh, and there are other ways of measuring it. If you look at um, uh, the students who started in September of 96 throughout the North Country, 85% um, as of last June had already taken and passed the exam. 11% uh, hadn't yet taken it, presumably, because they weren't ready. And they've, I would imagine, they've taken it either in January or in April or maybe, maybe this coming June. Uh, and 4% uh, tried in, uh, in 
were not successful. I remember you take this repeatedly. It's but like a driver's test. All the schools in the area, just about all, I think, were sure. lowered their passing grade for the regents. Yes. And, you know, 95% did pass, but they all did it with a lowered passing grade, which they can only keep in place for a certain number of years. That's right. <clears throat> the regents wanted to make sure that, that this was possible, and you know, people really focused that, that, uh, that it was possible. So temporarily, uh, at a local option, students are allowed to pass at 55. Now, for the students who are entering the ninth grade next year, by the time they they get to uh, to the end of their high school, they will have to uh, pass that that exam at 65. Now that's one of the things that people want to debate about, and some people have said um, it should be 65 now. Others have said not so fast. Um, we can't do it. Uh, the regions uh, they seem to be guided by the data. And, um, data so far positive. And how do you feel about? what the grade should be in the passing. I think we need to, to keep moving gradually upward. That's been the whole idea. Uh, up to what? Well, pass, certainly, certainly the pass rate ought to be back in 65. Uh, in, in recent times, we had a two-tiered system. High standards for some, uh, <coughs> therefore a rigorous curriculum and challenging exams. But everybody else uh, had low expectations, watered down curriculum and easy exams. What did that prove? We were graduating students who just were not um, up to the challenges of the workforce, up to the challenges of college, up to the challenges of citizenship. And uh, the regions just blew the whistle on that. So it's, uh, it's uh, high standards for all. We're gradually lifting the whole system. What do you want the, the standards to do? To do? Um, I think people can look within and uh, find the answer to that. Think about a young person who's important to you, a um, child, grandchild, a neighbor's child. And you think, what do I want from that kid? Um, I remember from one the child to uh, be happy as a child, <coughs> the child to grow up, uh, to be competent, to have a choice of work. Uh, I want the child to become a citizen who's able to bear the burden of citizenship. So it's, it's about uh, very, very fundamental American values. Um, high standards are all of our young people for work, for citizenship, and for life of competence. Is it tough enough? The standards? I think we're going to look back. Uh, I, I think for now, yes, uh, the standards are reasonable, uh, but they're a stretch. I think five years from now, we're going to look back and say it's time to rank love again. We're not testing all the standards either. Uh, by design, we decided we would start with the five regions examinations, and they test a, a, a great range, and they, they test all the core areas, but there's some areas, like the arts, that are not, not incorporated into our regions testing system. I don't know what we'll do in the future, but that, that those are the kinds of things that once we get through the, the current transition, we, we're certainly going to want to look at. But that's several years away. Most current fourth grade exams showing an improvement? Oh, you're full of really great questions, and I can that one I, I can answer tomorrow. Uh, at 10.30, <laughs> I want you to... Uh, but you know the answer I now. I certainly do know the answer. <laughs> okay, well, so, you, some indication of what it is? Uh, Good, I, bad, or? You see me smiling. <laughs> but I'm not going to uh, I'm not gonna we, get we, into We're in a difficult story. position because we have agreed to give the superintendents a window in which they would be able to see their results and be able to analyze them. And the, the window closes tomorrow, and we shouldn't. Uh, yeah, but our window's open today. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I realize you're our window closes when you walk out the room. You can come back tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, I'll be doing a satellite feed uh, that uh, you oh. can get into, and we glad to talk to anybody. Talk to you. We give you a phone number so that you can uh, get into that. It's 518-474-1201. Uh, Talk to uh, Alan Ray, and uh, uh, we'll make that happen. A number of our uh, school districts uh, say that they're they're having to spend more money hiring more teachers and so on. Did you anticipate that, that this would become a that the cost would become a factor? Well, uh, it certainly um, is the case that uh, people made uh, quite an investment in education recently in New York. Uh, it's been an investment locally. It's also been a statewide investment. 
governor and the legislature, uh, strong urging the Board of Regents, has put uh, $3.4 billion more into education in the last four years. Uh, some of the good deal of that has gone into building, uh, it's gone into other, other things. Um, I think it's also important for people to uh, look at uh, what they have. Every school that I've ever been in has faculty, they have books, they have classrooms, they have curriculum. Um, the transformation that's going on is to uh, strengthen the capacity there, strengthen the curriculum, strengthen the teaching skills, own the leadership skills. So uh, uh, institution like OSIS is becoming more and more, and more important. If you're, if you're going to be a teacher or a school leader, in New York, you're a student. <coughs> in fact, if you're a commissioner, you're a student. And all uh, called to uh, sharpen our, our skills. And there will certainly come a time when uh, New York can't uh, say that it's put another billion dollars on the table. And yet we will not be able to say, uh, it will pull back. We, we don't want people to uh, say of us that we were at our best when we were going was good. Regions are in this for the long haul, and there's quite a head of steam up. The kids are doing a great job, and we keep going. I think if any of us on the board were aware that during the transition to the education reform levels we're going to, that it was going to cost more. But I think we're also aware that it is possible to do things differently, and that you can go back to the, the budget, so to speak, and restructure it so that you do the kinds of things that get you to the standards with the with approximately the same level of resources that you might have done things differently with earlier. And the transition is difficult because you're, you're sort of adding on academic intervention services, adding on things, but people haven't come to the realization yet that there are some things that they're going to need to stop doing. And we'll get through that eventually. We'll also get to the point where uh, children coming into, say, grade nine, will have come through the system so that they will have achieved level three and four on the third and fourth grade examinations and level three and four on the eighth grade examinations. So if they'll go into high school better prepared, so you'll need fewer academic intervention services higher up than we need now during this transition period. And I think that the costs ultimately will crest and begin to at least level off. It's hard to say whether it'll go down when we start talking about inflation and all of that, but in, in, in just general terms, they will certainly level up. It's not, I don't foresee it as a, a constant, steady, billion dollar increase on education at the state level every year. That's just not possible, we know that. When do you expect to see that crest? Well, I think we're starting to see it now. Uh, I think the, uh, as, we, as we get to the point where uh, students have been tracking on the fourth grade examinations, their competencies are going up. I don't want to spill the beans about tomorrow, but, but I, think, I think the reality is, uh, uh, each successive year that we go further into this, a higher percentage, a smaller percentage of level ones appear, a smaller percentage of level twos appear, and the shift is up, is upward. So, what so you're you saying can consistently see more level fours, and they don't need remediation when they get into the, you know, if it's, it's on the fourth grade, they don't need it when they get into the middle school, or if it's on the eighth grade, they don't need it when they get into the high school. Because a lot of schools are talking about adding for AIS. We've mandated and you're that. Well, we've mandated that. We require AIS because we feel that every child ought to, ought to be identified early and, and be given that extra help. The academic intervention services that we were talking about. So another yeah, way. extra help. And, yeah, extra. So what areas should they stop? Where should they stop spending their monies? Well, that, that's, again, the local <coughs> conversation that I was describing uh, in, in, uh, in one of the schools that I visited. Uh, you cannot classroom or anywhere else just keep adding on and uh, the teachers that I, that I was talking to today are very practical people they want the, the level of performance to rise steadily and so every year they spend a period of time in the, in the summer looking at the results and uh, talking about what can be taken out of the curriculum so that things can be uh, punched up and, and they're, they're um, Basically, uh, as I understood them, they're, 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 they're dropping parts of their practice that were not as effective and putting in more effective you know, practices. They're, 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 uh, in one case, they were talking about uh, there, was, there wasn't enough time spent on the Pythagorean theorem. So they had quite a discussion about that. And uh, certain things have to happen at an earlier rate so students are ready for that. 
That's about time. time. I mean, it, it, the cost in education is largely in the cost of pay, uh, the cost of staff. And so staff really reorient how they do things as they become more familiar with the standards and understand what's what's effective in terms of reaching those standards. So that's where the that's what you stop doing. You stop doing those things that are not effective in your subject area at your grade level for the for reaching those standards. I see that all across the state. I had a conversation with teachers on Long Island uh, a few months ago. Actually, it was prompted by the principal. Uh, she said that uh, she's constantly going to teachers and saying, uh, you know, "Why exactly are you teaching this?" Uh, let's we've all agreed on what we want them to know at the end. Let's go backwards from there. And uh, if what we do produces that result, let's do it more and more effectively. If it doesn't, if it's not successful, well, then let's stop doing that. One of the with all the emphasis on children who need more help, one of the things that some of the local schools are cutting are their enrichment programs or their gifted and talented programs. And there's a fear from some parents that there's going to be so much emphasis on the ones who aren't doing well, the other ones are going to be forgotten. Well, I, that's, that's a perennial uh, concern. It's something that communities need to talk about all the time. Uh, I, however, uh, see uh, deep concern in the schools for the needs of children who are more gifted. And um, people are constantly in the schools trying to balance uh, the program. Um, one of the conversations I'm going to have, uh, is, uh, we're actually all going to have in the fall, is uh, over this question of how do we uh, continually uh, support the, uh, the growth of high-performing schools and high-performing students. This, this uh, <coughs> region's reform is not about holding anybody back. It's about lifting all. I haven't actually seen that. Uh, if you look at gifted and talented in a, in a totality, gifted and talented by that name, where you tie that back to the state aid, which is very minimal in that category, that may be true. But if you look at the number of advanced placement courses that are being offered now in the high schools and the diversity of those and the number of children taking those, that's way up across the state. So that uh, students are really, in fact, as a result of our putting in new standards, are in fact moving forward and, and, and taking less in the way of study halls and more in the way of advanced, more challenging, even college level courses. So I think if you look at talented rubric broad, that, that I think it's actually improving where the system's improving itself. Is, but, a, uh, is a longer school year part of uh, helping the uh, regents program? The regents have uh, not explicitly said we want a longer school year. They have uh, investigated the issue of time. There's a important uh, federal report about five years ago called uh, Prisoners of Time. The regents spent, uh, spent uh, several months uh, debating that. Uh, I think that we are close to a year-round school uh, system without even realizing it in some parts of the state. The summer school has grown so rapidly. New York City, for example, two years ago, they had a 30 increase in one year. Um, the regions have uh, campaigned uh, for several years to change the, the funding system so that uh, aid will flow uh, more generously in the summertime. Um, my personal view is that um, we should uh, be very skeptical about simply adding days until we're certain that we're using the days we already have. In other words, uh, some of our some of the other countries around the world are very, very protective of an academic day. Um, you know, I believe in that. That's why when I visit a school, I, one of the things I tell the, the, the leaders of the school is, I don't want to interrupt the classroom. The work going on, the most important work going on is work done by the teacher and the student. And the commissioner and the region, we're visitors, we're watching, so we try very hard not to interrupt that. The Europeans and Asians have criticized the U.S. system for not having a longer school day and school year. Is it a fair criticism? Well, actually, in, if you read that report, uh, Prisoners of Time, they point out that the actual academic day, school day, is sometimes shorter uh, than, than in the United States. It's just, it's, an, it's a rigorous academic day when students do homework. Many American schools, you find that uh, the school day is uh, basically sort of a uh, collection of serious academic work and then not so serious things. And sometimes uh, people 
will act as if the homework is really to be done in school because there's television and other kinds of uh, demands late at night. So it's, it's not a simple matter of simply adding more time. Adding more days means adding um, uh, you know, a lot more money without a deservable uh, payback. Uh, I think what the Regents have done is to take the, the, the year that we have and to be extraordinarily uh, focused on their expectations. The expectations uh, about the things that parents would I think, want for every child. Spelling, grammar, punctuation, literacy, uh, real competence in the math and mathematics and the sciences and the arts and so on. And, uh, they measure that and they report the results and put great support behind the system and also great pressure on it. And the system is changing very rapidly in terms of its, its performance. Uh, will we in the future have to add more time? Well, for some kids, the time is right now, uh, right around this part of the state, uh, to see the students tutoring, uh, after school, <coughs> summer, <coughs> session, summer session, la math labs to back up the math class. Uh, people are doing some very imaginative things with time. It's all focused on higher performance. Summer session, the enrollments are way up. And that's uh, voluntary. Across the state, roughly. Right. Well, I couldn't. Uh, uh, and one, I'm looking it up. I don't know. It's probably over 20. Yeah. I think so. At least in this area. Some of the district superintendents are here. What do you, well, you've got significant additions to your summer session yeah, programs. Yes, the yes. yeah, numbers are crazy. Well, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I keep hearing that. The state's been uh, extraordinarily generous uh, with aid currently, yet some superintendents tell me that they still don't have enough operating aid, that that, that never increases. Yes, it doesn't never increase, but it doesn't increase by as much as uh, the building aid, for example. Is that, what's the outlook for that? Well, you chaired the committee, you want to talk about that? Well, I mean, uh, operating aid has gone up. Uh, it, it's uh, <coughs> true that the regents have attempted to try to shift more of the increases in operating aid to what we call our high need school districts, which is, includes a significant number of North Country districts, but not all North Country districts. Uh, the legislature is being partially responsive, I would say, to the, to the regents' interest in doing that. And, 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 uh, would mean, of course, that some districts are not going to see the increases where others others have, in fact, seen the increases. Actually, it, it state aid is, a, is a, another reminder that it's a really, really big state out there. Um, uh, I would say on Long Island, Westchester, upstate, uh, the superintendents um, have, uh, are very clear that they need greater flexibility and they want uh, a greater proportion of the increase to be in operating aid. New York City and some of the other cities, uh, people uh, will tell you that um, they don't want the operating aid increase because if it's flexible money, it won't get to the school. It has to be categorical. It has to be uh, uh, mailing labeled on the practice. And um, so that's the tension that, that you see played out in the legislature. And uh, any state aid proposal is a, is a compromise that satisfies upstate, downstate, and to the best degree possible. So far, it's, uh, it seems to be working because there's so much money available. Uh, the real challenges will be in the future. And, uh, we need to keep um, this. Uh, <coughs> well, with, with this building frenzy relatively behind us, do you, do you, does that mean that there might be more money available to designate one way or the other? Well, we deciding to move us to work. Regents are just taking up their, uh, their uh, they're beginning to do next budget uh, in June, and uh, there are an enormous number of propositions out there right now that could pass before the window of the 10% incentive closes, and the, the general sense in the department is that there's enough out there pending, both recently approved earlier this spring and likely to be approved later this spring, that will be busy most of next year approving uh, you know, designs for projects. So we won't be out of the woods in terms of knowing what the real expenditure on, on uh, capital construction is in the state until a year from now. When does a state building, um, is it a facilities report card or a building report card start where you're going to look at the actual buildings and structures and rate? Let's see, I'm not sure. I, I think that's in the coming year. I think it is. Too. And yeah, are you expecting the that you're going to find a lot of problems? 
with that? Are you expecting to find there's a lot of problems with the facilities or because of all the construction going on, do you? Well, I, my sense is that uh, the, the, uh, the most immediate needs were addressed in the uh, last two years with this tremendous uh, increase in the uh, building being available. Uh, but it's very important that we assess that uh, uh, Buffalo hasn't uh, built as much as they could. The city has not built nearly as much as they could. Last time I looked, the average age of a school building in Buffalo was about 60. Yeah. Over here, city, it's 49 years. Uh, so it's uh, New York uh, had a huge facilities problem. It's, we're in an era now where we are, uh, where local school boards and school <coughs> leaders and teachers are literally rebuilding the school system in every sense. New, new facilities and buildings, uh, curriculum is being. <coughs> quite a bit. Uh, we're going to be hiring a whole new generation of teachers over the next 10 years. Uh, half the super, 55% of the superintendents are, will be able, eligible to retire within five years. And so there's an enormous amount of change uh, in the air right now. It's, uh, it's very important that, uh, it, it have, uh, that it's very important that this change be guided by, by the standards. You don't really reach the full fruition of this first phase of, of the reform effort until the year 2005. That's when the first graduates will come out of the, been through the system all the way along. It struck me when I was reappointed as a regent last uh, April 1st uh, that this term I've just entered into will be over uh, before that graduating class of 2005 comes out and I really see the results of all this effort that we've done. Will those building report cards, I don't know if that's what you call them, will they help decide where funding goes once they start? Well, I think they'll, they'll certainly uh, help uh, they'll guide the legislature. Uh, I'm sure that they will be influential locally. The school report cards on the academic program uh, have been extremely influential. Uh, the media has uh, kept that in the public eye for uh, weeks at a time. Would that be rewarding the people who failed to do their construction job? Penalizing the people who did? I don't think so. I mean, if, if, if money were allocated under that report card, uh, well, okay. construction money has to be initiated at the local level. And according to your state aid ratio, all, all districts are eligible for the same incentive. So uh, the, the report card isn't going to drive new money. In fact, the window closes. The window on the 10% incentive closes even before the first report cards come out. What I meant was that it's, <coughs> it's going to be an opportunity to uh, check progress after having made this major public uh, investment. Uh, so what is it about now? Uh, report card on math, English, and so forth has uh, produced tremendous change. School board members run for election, and if the school, the school's uh, facilities report card goes up in election year, people are going to ask questions about that because they're very public, just like the academic report cards. We're told that that superintendents are hard to come by these days. That people aren't going into that line of work. What what's wrong with it? What's wrong with the system that doesn't produce enough potential superintendents? I, I don't think we uh, spent enough time talking about why that's a good thing to do with your life. Um, I, just, um, I, I personally think that this problem is going to be solved very quickly. Um, the 38 uh, district superintendents uh, are uh, coming together in, in groups to tap and, um, and develop uh, candidates, um, people who uh, right now are assistant superintendents or principals, maybe it never occurred to them that, that uh, they could be a superintendent, but things change when, when uh, people we respect come to you and say, we've watched you, uh, we need your leadership on a, on a different stage now, and we're going to stand by you and back your play. Uh, if, if you look at the numbers, 55%, uh, 50% say we're going to leave in five years, that means we only have to find 350. I've been 
in enough schools uh, to almost pick them out right now. I mean, I can, I can tell you where the talent is. It's so incredibly obvious when you go into a school. What's keeping them from taking the job? Well, uh, that's a great question. I think uh, several things. Uh, we have not guaranteed the quality of uh, leadership training. Uh, I, think this, I think the regulations and standards are more preparation of leaders in New York is too weak. We have a panel that uh, helped us come to that conclusion. Uh, basically, you have to take a certain number of courses and you're certified. That's not good enough. Uh, some of the people, some of the, some of the institutions here uh, in the business of preparing school leaders ought to stop. Uh, some others ought to, uh, ought to emerge. We want to see the ones that survive ought to be uh, much, much stronger. I think we need to build a recruiting uh, system Right now, it's mostly self-selection. Mm -hmm. It needs to transition into the system I was just uh, mentioning, where we, as a profession, look at the talent and, uh, and, and tap the people and, and, and train and develop and make sure that uh, they are prepared to do what's really necessary. It's uh, the job of the superintendent now uh, is it's increasingly focused on student achievement, student uh, learning. Uh, it's, um, it's not enough to come to a school district and, and uh, begin to focus on the building project and, and become absorbed in budget uh, issues. Those are really important things, but schools are measured in the public eye in terms of how well they educate children. And the superintendent and when he rises to that, uh, that position will have to be convincing. I think they are. We're, we are going to find those people. Uh, they're here. If you do all that, you don't give them more pay. Well, pay has, has been uh, steadily rising. Uh, market forces will decide that one. Is pay a roadblock for them? Well, um, some people um, in, in some parts of the state uh, is, is, that are highly competitive. Uh, you know, this is an issue that some, some school years are. Uh, what appear to be very generous uh, salaries are uh, rapidly, you know, they're just plucked out uh, sometimes by private industry, sometimes by, uh, by, by other school systems that are willing to pay even more. Leadership, one of the things that the regions have done by, by putting the standards in place is to put a premium on leadership. If you don't have strong leadership with the principal and superintendent, uh, the results for kids are not going to go in the long term. So school districts know that. Great hunger for leadership in every field: business, uh, military, uh, schools, and uh, we've got to uh, we've got to go to people and and uh, improve them and prepare them. I think something else we need to do: uh, we need to change, deliberately change the, the environment in which leaders work. I've given uh, more than a dozen speeches uh, in the last year just to business audiences, and the purpose was to tell them about what our competitors are doing, not what we're doing. And then to say, uh, I need you to stand behind superintendents. Because every time a superintendent stands up and says, I want to tell you about the new English results, and they're not as good as I want them to be, the entire audience has a, makes, makes a quick choice. Do we throw a rock or do we stand beside this person? So I told the business leaders that uh, men and women who are looking the truth in the eye and talking about what needs to be done for children to deserve our support because it's hard. It's really hard for them. And uh, we need to recruit leaders and understand them because they do this hard work. So I wonder about the ebb and flow of, of teachers in the, in the profession. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, you, you, you turn out one graduate per opening. Well, in the next five or ten years, we're told you're going to have mass a massive exodus. So, are you ready for that uh, in terms of the new teachers? Are, are there going to be enough new teachers? Well, this is, a, this is a generational issue. It's not the first time that we face this situation. Cyclically, uh, large groups of people come in and go out. Uh, we're facing another one of those times. There's always a panic. I don't think panic is uh, a reasonable response to communication. Regions have uh, set up a, uh, in fact, they, they went through a major root and branch change in teacher preparation. Uh, there are a thousand, more than a thousand 
proposals on my desk right now. From colleges and universities in New York, and all of those will be acted upon by, by uh, September. Um, so that's changing the way that works. The regions also said that they wanted to see a, a path for career changers, people who uh, were preparing for something else and decided that I really like to teach. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that this summer. So that's, that's about building the capacity to prepare teachers. The other side of the equation is a recruiting message. And the legislature and the governor put $25 million on the table uh, for recruiting teachers. And just, uh, in fact, the governor just signed it last week. So um, we are in the bidding war for talent. Historically, uh, New York has always been an exporter of teachers. And I expect that that's going to continue. I think the issues are going to be in some of the high needs districts where it's always been difficult to get good teachers to go and we're focusing our efforts on trying to turn that around. But the traditional districts are not going to have this, this problem in a huge way. Mm -hmm. There will be some subject areas where there'll be shortages in the short term. Mm -hmm. We work that through. But that's always been true. Has New York been an exporter because there haven't been enough jobs? I think New York may be an exporter because we have an excellent higher education uh, uh, resource, if you will, both public and private, and we've historically produced a lot of teachers for that reason. Uh, we've also had, uh, with some exceptions, we've had, we've had high quality education, uh, higher education institutions in teacher preparation. And, and, and people come to New York to hire teachers. You know that. In some other states, they just never built that. They never built the resource to the same depth at the higher education level. Industry assessments are coming out. A lot of teachers are saying that, well, some teachers are saying that it's taking mm -hmm. them longer to get in the tests. There's more people that are involved in it. You're coming to the end of the year, and they're having to spend more time. We're talking about a longer school year for students. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be an issue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
purpose of this whole enterprise is to educate children. But the question in my mind always is, did we learn more? Did we learn what we need to learn? Okay, so you want to send a light tomorrow? Yes. Thank you. Up on the bird. Thank you very much, all of you. But we'll give you oh, one more, uh, just one more yeah. chance. Yeah, you can, you can. Uh, uh, we, we're in a hurry. But we could stay. <laughs> you want to spill the beans now? Uh, if, it's good, if it's good news for New York, why not? I'm guessing if it were bad news, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true.